Beneath the frozen ground of the northernmost region of Finland lies a discovery with the potential to change the world's future. From nuclear energy to electric cars, these minerals make it feel like a sci-fi future is just around the corner. But, as always, it's not that simple. Let's explore why. All the way up here on the map is a region called Lapland. A land with only one chair for every two people, so someone has to sit on someone else's lap. It's a remote snow-covered corner of Finland, where reindeer outnumber people who live there. Here, the night sky glows with the northern lights almost 200 times in a single year. Oh, and Santa Claus has a house there. In 1985, Finland declared that Santa lives in Rovaniemi, a town just south of the Arctic Circle in Lapland. They even built Santa Claus Village, where visitors can meet with them. You can cross the Arctic Circle line and see his main post office which receives hundreds of thousands of letters from kids worldwide every year. So, it's sufficient to say that most people know about this place because of Santa's workshop, rather than scientific news. But deep below the ice in pine forests is the Sockley deposit. It's a massive mineral geological site that's been studied for decades. It's mostly known for iron and phosphate. We use iron to make, well, almost everything while phosphate mostly ends up as fertilizer to grow our food. However, recently, surveys revealed rare earth elements, niobium, and traces of radioactive metals like thorium and uranium. The possibility of thorium is what made news outlets excited. Thorium is a naturally occurring, slightly radioactive metal. It's way more common in the Earth's crust than uranium. In fact, it's about three to four times as abundant. Scientists love it because thorium could be turned into nuclear fuel with huge numbers as the output gain. A chunk of thorium the size of a golf ball could, in theory, generate as much energy as several tons of coal. It also comes with some major perks. Thorium reactors would produce less waste, meaning that thorium is much easier to contain and safer to use. And it even has an interesting trivia. Thorium was once used in old-fashioned gas lantern mantles because it glows when heated. And that's not all. The Sockley deposit also has other rare minerals that are critical for making magnets that go into wind turbines, electric cars, and even your smartphone. With the right investment, this single deposit could help Europe build thousands of new wind turbines or power millions of electric car batteries. So did Finland and the entire planet just hit the geological lottery? Well, yes and no. Today, nuclear plants don't run on thorium, they run on uranium, the trusty fuel that has been powering reactors for decades. The whole system, from mining to reactor design to handling the waste, is built around uranium. It already provides around 10% of the world's electricity. In fact, in some countries, like France, it's the main source. It works, it powers millions of homes, and the industry knows exactly how to handle it. Thorium does not play by the same rules. It's not fissile, which means it cannot split and release energy on its own. Which is a fancy way of saying it needs a little help to become useful. You cannot just toss it into a regular reactor and expect magic to happen. That would be like trying to charge a Tesla by pouring gasoline into the tank. To make thorium work, you'd need different types of reactors and the system that could support them. One that's expensive, experimental, and not yet ready for prime time. So yes, Sockley's thorium looks impressive. It's full of sparkle and promise. But for now, it is staying underground, waiting for future technologies and investments. But what about those other rare earth elements? Neodymium and praseodymium might be tricky to pronounce, yes they are. But they're hiding inside almost everything these days, from earbuds to the massive MRI machines in hospitals. They drive the motors in electric cars and help giant wind turbines spin. In short, they're everywhere. And then there's niobium. This metal makes steel even stronger. Add a little niobium and suddenly you've got stronger, lighter alloys used in bridges and even rockets. Today, Europe imports nearly all of it, mainly from Brazil. If Sokli were developed, 
Finland could give Europe a homegrown supply. However, again, it's complicated. Like I mentioned, Lapland happens to be one of the most beautiful places on the entire planet. It's one of Europe's last great wildernesses, where pine forests stretch for miles. And digging up all those materials wouldn't be without consequences. Mining at this scale could ruin the landscape, upset Santa, or endanger delicate Arctic ecosystems. After all, we're talking about radioactive elements. It's not just about nature, though. Indigenous Sami communities live in Lapland, so they have a voice in what happens. It's a tricky situation that relies on more research and tech advancements. Until then, what are some other delicate places that could hide thorium? Well, thorium is not that hard to find. It's tucked away in beach sands and mountain deposits. But the coolest place to get it would be from the moon. Back in the 1990s, NASA's Lunar Prospector spacecraft mapped the lunar surface and spotted areas unusually rich in thorium. Now, that's an incentive for speeding up the future moon missions, especially since our satellite probably hides elements like helium-3, which are incredibly rare on our planet. Mining the moon might be a perfect solution. Big companies will certainly have way less competition. But hey, that sounds like a decent challenge for humanity, given that the moon has no atmosphere which makes it exposed to radiation and wild temperature changes. So, we will see. Meanwhile, let's go back to Earth for another seemingly unrelated discovery. Going down to the deep ocean seabeds, scientists recently found something pretty surprising. While exploring the Pacific Abyssal Plains, they discovered polymetallic nodules. These are potato-sized lumps of metal that are also important for making batteries. But the cool part is that the nodules seem to be releasing oxygen into the water. Scientists call it the dark oxygen. Ooh. Normally, oxygen comes from photosynthesis, which needs sunlight to reach plants, algae, or bacteria. But down here, in total darkness, there is no sunlight. The idea is that these rocks act like tiny batteries. Their surfaces can create very small electric currents and split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Basically, these rocks might be quietly breathing oxygen all on their own. If this is true, it could change how we understand deep sea life. Some creatures might not just rely on hydrothermal vents or food falling from above. They could be getting a secret oxygen boost from the rocks themselves. Now, research is still new, and some researchers say this oxygen could be contaminated or just too little in volume to matter. But if it's real, it means life in the abyss might have a secret oxygen supply we never even knew existed. Creepy, mysterious, and kind of amazing all at once. It also makes us wonder about life on other planets. If rocks on Earth can make oxygen in total darkness, maybe extraterrestrial oceans on moons like Europa or Enceladus can too. The universe might be full of secret oxygen factories just waiting to surprise us. Finally, aside from thorium, Finland recently made headlines with another cool geological discovery. Scientists found some zircon crystals that washed into rivers, and when they looked closer, they noticed that the chemical signatures didn't match local rocks. Instead, they traced back to Greenland. This suggests that part of Scandinavia's ancient base might actually have come from there. In simpler terms, it's possible that Scandinavia broke off from Greenland and drifted across the ocean billions of years ago. This unexpected link makes the Nordic landscape a lot older and more interesting than we previously thought. Whether the Sokli deposit could power the future with infinite energy remains to be seen. Each day seems to bring another discovery that inspires conversation and prompts us to learn something new. Who knows what new technologies or hidden resources the next decade will uncover? Now, excuse me, since I've learned his address, I have to write a letter to Santa. I, uh, I'm still trying to get off of his naughty list. Hey, quick question. How many continents are there? Seven? Maybe five? There's no correct answer. According to different approaches, the range is between four to seven. But it might actually be as many as eight. Chances are, a lost continent has recently been found between Greenland and Canada. 
This new continent discovery could also potentially be the key to how microcontinents form. What does this all mean, and what makes this hidden landmass near Greenland so important? Now, if you're like me, and if you are, then there's two of us. When you hear the word continent, you probably think of land like Europe or Africa, places above water where people live. But in science, a continent isn't about being above sea level. It's about what the land is made of. Earth's outer layer, called the crust, comes in two main types, continental and oceanic. Continental one is thicker, lighter, and made of different types of rock, like granite. The oceanic crust is thinner, heavier, and made mostly of dark volcanic rock. Now, the discovery under the Davis Strait, between Greenland and Canada, appears to be a piece of continental landmass, even though it's under the ocean. Scientists call it a proto-microcontinent, because it began to break off from a larger terrain millions of years ago, but never quite made it. As tectonic plates slowly shifted, the Earth's crust in this region stretched and cracked. One chunk started to split away, but for some reason, the process stopped. It didn't drift off like a full continent, and it didn't sink like ocean crust either. Instead, it stayed right there, floating beneath the waves all this time. This makes it different from true microcontinents, like Zealandia, which have completely detached and now exist as separate tectonic blocks. Zealandia is a submerged microcontinent near New Zealand. About 94% of it lies underwater. But because it's made of continental crust, many geologists say it qualifies as Earth's eighth continent. However, Zealandia is still debated because it's too big to be a microcontinent and there's no official global body to define its status. There's no global organization like the UN or some kind of international geology council that can declare, hey, this is a new continent. Unlike Madagascar, which is fully above sea level and widely accepted by geologists as a classic example of a microcontinent, Zealandia is still waiting for a proper label. I know you're probably wondering, isn't Madagascar an island? Mm. The simple answer is, it's both. It's the fourth largest island in the world completely surrounded by water. But it's also geologically considered a microcontinent because it broke off from the supercontinent Gondwana around 88 million years ago and is made of continental crust, not oceanic crust. Unlike volcanic islands like Hawaii, this isn't just built from lava. It's a real piece of ancient continental crust. So Madagascar checks both boxes – island by geography, microcontinent by geology. And that's exactly why these discoveries can be fascinating. Just like Madagascar stands out above the waves, this newly discovered landmass under the Davis Strait stands out beneath them, thanks to its unusual structure. What makes it stand out is its unusual thickness. Most of the ocean floor is thin, like metal. This is more like packed clay, layered with continental materials. Underneath this cozy comforter, scientists discovered some odd layers of rock. Unusual, because they're not where they should be. These layers act more like the materials found on continents rather than those typically seen on ocean floors. There are hints of granite-like formations and distinct magnetic properties, which suggest that this stuff is similar to what makes up dry land. The size is also remarkable. The proto-microcontinent is about 12 to 15 miles across, which makes it roughly the size of a mid-sized city, like Manhattan Island that's 6,500 feet underwater. The fact that it sits right under the Davis Strait, one of the widest ocean passages on Earth, makes it one of the largest submerged continental fragments we've found. According to researchers, this landmass began to form between 58 and 49 million years ago, when Greenland and Canada were slowly drifting apart. Maybe they just weren't getting along. Mm -hmm. Hey, it happens. As they pulled apart, the crust under the Davis Strait stretched, and one of the main fault lines shifted. But the breakup didn't finish. Around 48 million years ago, the rifting stalled and Greenland's motion away from Canada slowed dramatically when it later bumped into Ellesmere Island. It's like a car swerving off and then back onto the freeway, a turn that was never completed. That's basically what happened. A chunk of land got stuck between the motion. It didn't float off into the ocean like a new continent, and it didn't get pulled down into the Earth either. It just stayed where it was, stranded beneath the water. 
But that's not all. This chunk has its own fault system. And scientists say it actually looks like a miniature version of the San Andreas Fault in California. Now, a fault is basically a crack in the Earth's crust where sections of rock slide past each other. Think of it as a place where the Earth's surface split and tried to slide sideways. In California, this movement still happens today and can cause earthquakes. But under the Davis Strait, it's a different story. The movement started, then suddenly stopped, like hitting pause in the middle of a big shift. It's a frozen moment in the planet's past, preserved right beneath the waves. For geologists, that makes the microcontinent under Davis Strait incredibly valuable. That sudden pause in motion helps explain why some chunks of land break away cleanly, while others twist, stall, or disappear. But this isn't just academic. By studying how continents break apart or stall, scientists can better predict future shifts in land, fault lines, and seismic activity. And predicting earthquakes and geological hazards could prove quite valuable to everyone. Knowing how microcontinents form could help us anticipate how the planet's surface might shift over millions of years, which affects everything from climate models to resource availability. But even just the technological advancement needed for such discoveries is greatly beneficial. The same tools used to map this hidden land are used for oil exploration, laying undersea cables, climate monitoring, and even search and rescue missions. Speaking of technology, for a long time, this hidden landmass near Greenland remained invisible. Just 10 or 15 years ago, the ocean floor under the Davis Strait was basically a mystery. It's deep, almost frozen, obviously not the easiest place to explore. But today, thanks to modern tools, a new continent discovery could be just a matter of time. Scientists can finally see and hear what's going on under all that water. First, they use seismic reflection imaging. That's a method where ships send sound waves down to the ocean floor and record how they bounce back. Various layers of rock reflect sounds in different ways, which helps build a picture of what's hidden underneath. It's kind of like how bats use echoes to see in the dark. Satellites also play a role in collecting gravity data. This may sound strange, but different types of rocks have slightly different weights. Heavier rocks create stronger gravitational pull, and satellites can measure those tiny differences. Another tool commonly used for these explorations is underwater sensors, which sit quietly on the seafloor and listen for natural vibrations, like many earthquakes or shifts in rock. These vibrations help scientists figure out what the crust is made of and how thick it is. They're basically ears on the ocean floor. They also most likely used AUVs, or autonomous underwater vehicles, basically robot submarines that can scan the seafloor in high resolution, even under thick ice. In any case, scientists are very excited because this new continent discovery is more than just a geological surprise. It's what they call a natural laboratory. The study of the microcontinent Davis Strait offers a rare opportunity to understand how microcontinents form, evolve, and sometimes fail to fully separate. It also reminds us that Earth's crust isn't as neatly divided as we once thought. Beneath the ocean, there may be other hidden landmasses near Greenland or elsewhere, almost continents just waiting to be found. This lost continent of Canada may not have made it as a fully-fledged landmass, but its discovery is already reshaping how we view plate tectonics. And thanks to advances in technology, places we once ignored are now offering up secrets about the planet's deep past, and maybe even its future. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.